Hey guys, in this video I'm going to show you how to use a potentiometer to dim your Meanwell HLG B-Series driver. Now the first thing that you need to do is make sure that you've ordered the right driver. There are two flavors of HLG drivers. You can get them as an A-type or a B-type, and that's indicated by the last letter in the part number. So here I've got a C1400B. What the B means is that you get the dimming leads on it, this uh, blue and white conductor that you see in the video. On the A-type, you get just a built-in potentiometer called IO Adjust, and you just turn that to dim just using a screwdriver. So on the B-type though, you see you get the dim plus and the dim minus, the blue and the white conductor that come out, and that's what you attach your potentiometer to, or your uh, pulse width modulation, or your voltage, or whatever. There's three ways to do it, but using a pot is definitely the easiest way to do it. So this is what a standard pot looks like. You've got three terminals and a knob in the middle, uh, between the left and the right terminal, you're always going to have the full resistance of the potentiometer. In this case, it's 100k ohms. But between the left in the center and the right in the center changes. That center pin is called the wiper. And as you turn the knob, it's changing the resistance between the left and center and the right and center. So this is what tells your driver how much current to pass to the LEDs. Now before you go out and pick up your potentiometer, you need to figure out what the range of resistance is that you need on it. And that's really only determined by one thing, which is how many drivers you're trying to dim at once with this potentiometer. If you're just trying to dim a single driver, which is probably the case for 90% of the people out there, uh, it's very simple. If you're looking to dim maybe two or three drivers at the same time with a single pot, there's a formula that you need to follow to determine what resistance that potentiometer needs to be. And to find this formula, just pull up any Meanwell HLG spec sheet, scroll down to the third or fourth page, I forget which one it is, but you'll see the three-in-one dimming specs, uh, find the one that says applying additive resistance and have a look at the little graph. You'll see on the y-axis uh, an output current percentage from 10 to 100 and then on the x-axis on the horizontal uh, resistance starting from 10k divided by n up to 100k divided by n. So the 100k divided by n refers to 100k ohms divided by n, which is the number of drivers that you're using for synchronized dimming. So if you have a single driver for 100% current output, you need 100k ohms divided by one driver equals 100k ohms. If you've got two drivers for 100% output, you need 100k divided by two drivers equals 50k ohms. So if you're trying to dim two drivers at once, you would need a 0 to 50k ohm potentiometer. So what would happen if you tried to use a 100k ohm potentiometer to dim two drivers? Well, let's say you started all the way at the minimum at uh, close to zero ohms uh, and worked your way up. The LEDs would get brighter and brighter up to 50k ohms of resistance where they would reach the max. And then from 50k ohms to 100k, it, would, uh, it wouldn't change. It would already be maxed out. So you'd essentially only have half a potentiometer's worth of dimming. So that's why they suggest that you use an actual 0 to 50 just to get the full range of motion on the potentiometer. Okay, so now that you've got your pot picked out and you've got it in front of you, you need to figure out which of the three leads that you're going to solder onto. And this will be determined by how you want the pot to work. So like I said before, on the left and the right terminal, between those two, you're always going to have the full resistance of the potentiometer. As you can see, as you turn the knob, it doesn't change. It's always 100K-ish on this one. But it's the relationship between the left and the center pin and the right and the center pin that matters. So now that I'm hooked onto the left and the center, as I turn the knob counterclockwise, it's decreasing in resistance from about 100K to about zero or close to it. So in this configuration, as you turn counterclockwise, the lights are going to dim. And as you turn clockwise, the lights are going to get brighter. And that's, that's the way that I want it to work. That's just kind of how I'm used to working, how pretty much every volume knob in the universe works. So I'll just show you the other way too, though. Like if you were to use the right pin in the center, it's just going to be reversed. So turning the knob counterclockwise is going to turn the lights brighter and turning the knob clockwise is going to make them dimmer.
Alright, so we've got our terminals identified. We know which ones we want to attach to. In this case, it's going to be the left and the center. So what we need to do now is get the cable prepped, both of those uh, blue and white leads, and tin the terminals on the potentiometer and tin the wire just to make soldering easier. So the first step is to sort of mock it up, just hold this cable up to the terminals. Make sure that both of the conductors are the same length, that makes it much easier and much neater. It doesn't matter whether you go white-blue or blue-white, it's just resistance between them. So in this case, you can have whichever on whichever pin. Hold them up, get an idea of what you want to do. I think I'm going to shorten this just a touch, just to make it really nice and neat. And then after it's shortened, I'll strip the cable and get ready to solder. So when you go to strip the cable, make sure you strip just enough. Uh, ideally, the stripped cable should be just about as long as the pin on the potentiometer. If it's too short, then you don't get very good contact, and you could burn the jacket with solder, which is no good. And if it's too long, then it's just it can be kind of unruly, and there's a better chance of a short happening. So just get them, like I say, about the same length as the terminal, and you're in really good shape. Now before you solder, if you want a really nice and clean install, uh, I would recommend you use heat shrink. So you get a little chunk like this. This is half inch to quarter inch heat shrink. And it just fits over the pot here and covers everything nicely. The beauty of heat shrink is that it prevents shorts from happening and it, it makes it look so much cleaner. So this piece is way too long. I'm just going to cut it in half and then run it over the cable and push it back a fair ways because you don't want it to be anywhere near the soldering iron because if it starts shrinking when it's not in the right place then it's a bitch to get back where you want it so get it way out of the way and then uh, start your soldering oh and before I get going on the soldering I've got to say if you do a lot of soldering I would highly recommend getting one of these little vices to hold your gear because it's such a pain in the ass trying to do it without this like rigging up some sort of system to hold on to this pot while I solder it so I would definitely recommend getting a vice like this so when your solder melts on your iron you're good to go first step is to tin the terminals which is uh, just melting a little bit of solder you try to get a glob on each of these terminals for the wire to stick to. Sometimes it doesn't really want to cooperate. Uh, in this one I end up giving kind of a gigantic blob, but it works. Definitely not my finest <laughs> my finest work, but it'll do. There we go. That's a that's a fatty. That'll work though. Uh, next step is to tin the wires. As you can see, I've already kind of tinned mine. What I did is I I attached it, and then I had forgotten to put my heat shrink on, so I had to take it off again and then re-tin them. But just put a little bit of solder on each of the tips of these things. Uh, keep some solder on the tip of your iron. It keeps it nice and hot. And then you just want to touch them, put them into place, and then heat the solder up around them on the bottom and top and just wait till it all sort of gels together and hold it in place as it cools don't pull it away right away and move on to the next one so the blue one turned out much nicer than the white wire but nothing's touching it's a really good and solid hold give it a pull test make sure it's not going anywhere and then that's it easy peasy so all you gotta do now is slide your heat shrink back up put some hot air on it and you're just about done. So there's a couple ways to shrink heat shrink. I've got a handy dandy little hot air blower attachment for my soldering iron. It's like a little butane iron which is really nice for having in the field. But uh, you can use a, a hot air blower or a heat gun or even a lighter works if you don't have any of those things. Just hold the lighter up beneath the, sh the heat shrink and that'll do the trick. Just sort of apply even heat all the way around and make sure it, it shrinks all the way down to its smallest size and uh, don't touch it because it gets super hot and I've burned myself a few times. So that's that and keep in mind I just put my pot right on the end of the leads that come off of the driver. If you need a longer lead you can just attach another set of conductors 
onto the lead that come off the driver, just splice them in and then put your potentiometer at the end of that run too. Like if you wanted to have your driver in your tent and have the potentiometer within reach, you know, 10, 15 feet away, just extend the cable out. Usually my drivers are very easily reachable for me, so I just put the potentiometer right on the lead here, but you've definitely got options. And last but not least, you've got to test the thing. So hook your LED driver up, grab your potentiometer and turn it. Make sure that max brightness is achieved by turning it in the direction that you had wanted. So in my case, counterclockwise dims and clockwise brightens. And you've got it made. That was almost too easy, I think. If you do have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And definitely stay tuned to my blog at ledgardener.com for more DIY guides on indoor growing with LEDs.